All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Stephen. Uh, my name is Carl Cloudy. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. Uh, from the student Fairfax. We're very humble and grateful that Stephen uh, Taylor accepted our invitation on the show. Uh, Stephen, this is part two. Welcome again, man. How are you doing? Hello, Claudio. Stephen W. Taylor here, as ever. <laughs> That's right. How are you, man? You doing all right? How the doing weather fine. Right? Well, th- uh, funnily enough, the weather today, looking out the window, it's pouring rain. So, uh, it's nice to be inside, um, even though I know the WOMAD festival is on at the moment, which I haven't been to this year, but I can imagine that's not very pleasant <laughs> being out. Oh, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Man, you are a little introduction. You're an English mixer and recording engineer, music producer, musician, composer <laughs> who has contributed to our hundreds of albums, including Bush, Kate Bush, of course, Susan Vega, Peter Gabriel, Duncan Sheik, Howard Young, Stephen X. Uh, Robert Hine, Tina Turner, um, The Fix, Howard Jones, blah, blah, blah. Man, yeah. you're a very famous guy, so I'm very grateful that you, you're oh, spending you. an hour of your time with me, man. I mean, it's, it's quite a diverse set of artists I've worked with over the years, which is why most of my career, I haven't really been sort of pigeonholed into one category. Um, yeah. I mean, there are certain areas I do specialize in, but, um, but it, yeah, it's been interesting and, you know, such a, an, a really fascinating bunch of people. Yeah. And they keep it fresh, you know? Yes. Yes. It's, I mean, there are some artists that I, I'm delighted to be invited back to work on uh, more projects, but um, it does keep it fresh when, when you're always changing to work with different genres and different styles of songwriting or music writing and uh, so i've been very blessed in that respect to um to be involved in all kinds of different capacities as well you know uh, from basic recording through mixing through co-production and production and in more recent years composition and some involvement with live events not much but um but that has also been fascinating all right, good for you, man. Let's go back to the period of your starting your career between 76 and 80. Uh, three bring names that I want to bring you to attention. Gong, Bill mm-hmm. Bruford, of course. Uh, what do you, any recollection, any memories from that period in your life? Well, um, working with Gong was, um, was not incidental, but it was, it turned out to be one of the first, uh, it was in fact the first uh during the first month of me as a mixing engineer and i was working with uh, a producer called um dennis mckay who had been a staff engineer at trident and he went on to become a producer and he got involved in all kinds of acts like mahavishnu and shakti and um and gong and uh tommy bolin uh, Tommy Bolin was the first one, but Gong was very shortly after that. And I only came in at the mixing stage. So uh, during during that, I th- I seem to remember only meeting Pierre Merlin um, during the mix sessions, because literally it was just um, Dennis coming in with the tapes and Pierre. And um, I'm not sure I even met Alan Holdsworth at that stage because he had played on the album. Brilliant. Correct, yeah um but that was uh, a real experience for me because yes i'm working alongside uh dennis mckay who who was one of the finest engineers well still is but at, at that period he was quite sort of uh creative and innovative and so i i picked up a lot from working with him and he had picked up a lot working alongside ken scott before that so there was this sort of uh lineage of uh interesting production techniques etc so um i don't remember much about the gong album other than uh, it it really suited my my sort of musical tastes at that time so i felt very lucky to work on that after soon after that um i started to get more involved with um the actual recording and mixing of projects one of the first where i did the whole 
thing from start to finish would have been with Brand X. But very shortly after that, having got to know uh, Brand X's keyboard player, Robin Lumley, Robin was asked to produce Bill Bruford's solo album, um, Feels Good to Me. And Robin asked me to come alongside him and record and mix it. So here was my introduction to uh, to Bill Bruford. Now, I'd been a big Yes fan during the uh, the Yes album period and Fragile. So I, I was I was a big fan big of fan. that. So, so th that was really um, a great opportunity and and to meet the other great musicians but particularly Anne, alan holdsworth who uh now this was a a second hookup but this time i get to record him and meet him so uh that was a fascinating project i mean back in those days recording an album such as that was done, rel done relatively quickly i have to say you know we've had two or three weeks of recording and then about 10 days of mixing at the most, you know, that, that, that so bands would come in fairly well prepared. What I do remember about uh, Bruford was that so much of the music was not only sort of written and rehearsed, but it had been handwritten. Bill would write all those complex, um, particularly like the uh, marimba or xylophone parts, or vibraphone, sorry, vibraphone or marimba, as well as um, all the keyboard parts for uh, Dave Stewart, so um, it was very well. It was very well prepared, but it allowed for myself and Robin Lumley to start thinking of sort of interesting approaches to the recording techniques, and uh, so we started to develop a lot of things that then sort of led us through the next few years. Yeah, that's great. Steven, you mentioned something interesting. Is it for someone like myself that, you know, don't do that for a living? It's a big difference between, obviously, I, I assume that the pay is better if you do the recording and the mixing. But at the beginning, you were doing just the mixing. Is it so the recording is already done for any band, right? X, Y, Z band. The recording is already done. Okay, now, Steven, sit here. I want you to mix the stuff. Is it's a lot harder. I mean, the product is kind of already done, right? Ninety percent done. Is it? Is it? And, the, and it, let's say the recording is great. I suppose that the mixing, easy for me to say, won't be that difficult. But if the recording is not that great, how how can you kind of improve it, fix it, uh, add your Steven Taylor touch mm -hmm. if the stuff is kind of ninety well, percent cooked, so to speak, right? Yes, that's a very interesting question. Uh... I mean, things have really changed in those early days when I started. Um, really, a lot of um, choices and techniques had to be committed at the time of recording. It wasn't it wasn't like now where you have multiple chances to redo something and do right. hundreds of alternative takes and things. You you had to not only get the 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 sound quality as you hoped um, to capture it, which would give you maximum amount of control for uh, the mixing process. But it's about committing the performance. And, and that was really, you know, capturing the sound was really important, but it's, it's managing in a very sort of uh, limited time period to get the performance onto tape because back then, once it was on tape, there was very little you could do in the mixing other than change the level, change the compression or the equalization or add uh, the reverberation or the delays, but you weren't able to actually go in and sort of do editing the way we can now to fix things or make them louder or quieter. Or... So um, you, you, you really hoped that the quality of the recording was good, but also the quality of the performance. And I was quite lucky because I was getting projects in that had, had been recorded by people who really knew what they were doing. But then as I started to do it myself, you know, I began to learn the importance of, yes, getting a, a 
you don't want to commit a sound that you can't undo you know like it by adding too much distortion or too much effect but at the same time if you're happy with what you're hearing then you should capture it what's happened in more recent years is being able to say record something and say well we can decide how to deal with that later and that's become known as a, a bit like a thing called fix it in the mix which um it makes it interesting these days when i when i am sent a new project to mix quite often there's a lot of choice and a lot of tracks and the drums it's uh, uh might have been recorded with every microphone on a separate channel back then you didn't have enough tracks to do that so you had to be very good like recording bill bruford uh or phil collins back then we were recording on 24 tracks so you had to make choices about how many of those 24 tracks you could assign for the drums before that it was 16 tracks so generally there would be four tracks of drums the bass drum the snare drum and then a pair a stereo pair of tracks with all the other Tom toms, cymbals, hi hats, and everything mixed together. So you had to be very committed about how you assembled that. But that did mean that if it was done right, it made the mixing a lot simpler. These days, you've got to kind of go through the whole process of reassembling from scratch. Uh, and particularly now, I'm remixing a lot of projects that were recorded during those early days. It's a reminder of how good some some of that, you know that. Uh, real sort of making decisions there and then um it it was important and from time to time it really worked and from time to time it was um a real problem <laughs> and uh difficult to fix and you say I'm, I'm going back to you know working the old stuff are all those master tapes stored somewhere safely and over the years in for different bands that you can take the you you go back to the like the tapes or you or 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 improve generation after that so well um uh it's an interesting question because uh because i have been mixing a lot of albums that are you know up to and even more than 50 years old um sometimes tapes are lost forever sometimes they have deteriorated um to a, a very poor state and they can mostly be restored and then what we call digitized so they're copied from the, what the, the technique they have to do with a lot of old tapes is they have to bake them with, because they've become like uh they've started to disassemble and become the the oxide has become sticky and it it falls off the backing so what they have to do is they have to bake it so that it hardens and then they've got one chance one run through to play it back and record it digitally and that is what there's huge business these days of people doing that because so many back catalogs are you know just stored away in warehouses or as i say in some cases lost and you can't go back and remix but uh um but you know, I, uh, the, a lot of the older tapes I've I've received to remix from, some have been transferred and they're absolutely perfect. And occasionally, there you can hear there are issues, and then you have to try. At least these days, we have a lot more good restoration uh, possibilities with software and various techniques. But um, but uh, but it. it as I say, it's interesting seeing how good the quality of the original recording was, how good the performance was and the capture of it, and then how well it can be restored after all this time. Very good. <clears throat> the year after in 78 and 79, you were with Peter Gabriel in his second album, uh, Scratch. I think you did the mix there for the label Charisma and then uh, and then you did another track uh, a year after uh, for the track called I Don't Remember. 
uh, you know, feel free to elaborate of memory you have with uh, Peter and uh, Rod Fripp in the same room and arguing and trying to make it better. One can say, do it this way. The other guy, no, 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 whatever. Whatever you can tell without being sued by, by the... <laughs> well, the, um, it, it was a very interesting thing, really, because yeah. um, th they had recorded um, in various places uh, outside the country and they came into Trident Studios to mix it. And I wasn't the uh, engineer that was brought into the project, um, was one of the other staff engineers. <clears throat> and I think what had happened, it, the mixing wasn't going very well because there was a certain sort of friction between Peter and Robert Fripp uh, on, a, on an artistic level. You know, they, uh, they agreed in a lot of ways and, you know, it was a very interesting um very interesting uh, concept the way it was produced but um what they they had this fairly inexperienced engineer who was kind of caught in the middle between them and he wasn't he wasn't coping with it well i mean he was inexperienced but also from a personality point of view i think he wasn't um he wasn't managing to kind of get things done I was brought in uh, as one of the other staff engineers and really it was almost like um, to become a sort of diplomat in the middle of this situation. So I had to work alongside this other engineer but sort of take over from him and try and resolve the, the sort of differences that Peter and Robert were, um, were having. And it's hard to remember because, as usual, I probably just, you know, Set my head Concentrate down. on the job, right? Yeah, and just got got on with it, and, and as always, trying to sort of make sure everybody was getting what they received. So um, it was mostly that uh, Robert really wanted to keep it fairly minimal in terms of uh, effects or treatments. It was was to keep it fairly dry and unaffected, apart from Peter's voice, which had a very uh, deliberate effect on it using a uh, uh, a device called an eventide harmonizer which can change the pitch slightly and um, it was to kind of give his voice uh, a sort of double layer of sound by having it slightly out of tune with itself and so that was the one sort of real effect along with um, and I wasn't part of the recording, but along with like Robert's um, tape loop type of effects, his layering and all the rest. So, but it was really interesting. I didn't mix every track. I did about 80% of the mixes on that. But, um, but it ended up with two of my all time favorite uh, tracks that I've worked on. One being uh, White Shadow, which I think is the most amazing track. And also, um, I can't remember I can't remember the title of the other but um one of the more sort of uh acoustic based songs beautiful uh so it it was it was a bit of a challenge but that was my introduction to Peter and um because I was becoming more involved with Hit and Run which was um the company that looked after Genesis and Consequently, uh, they set up another um, uh, division for Peter after he left Genesis. Um, and um, so uh, Peter had gone on, on the road to do promotion for the Scratch album. Uh, but while they were passing through London, he wanted to record uh potentially what they thought might be a next single but um uh, anyway it was a sing it was a track they uh, the band were in, in town for a couple of days and they came into trident to record it and um i was brought in to to engineer this and consequently uh was given a sort of co-production credit on it because it was kind of peter really producing it himself, but with the sort of technical side uh, handled by me. So 
I recorded that and then they went off on tour in America um, shortly after that and the track wasn't finished but it just so happened I was visiting America for the very first time in my life around the same time and so I managed to hook up with them in New York uh, to record um, Robert Fripp doing an, a guitar overdub solo for uh, I Don't Remember the track it was um and so that was done and then a few days later they were in chicago and i happened to be in chicago at the same time as well so they did a show but uh, on a day off they came into a local studio there to record peter's vocal and for me to mix the track and um so that that was quite kind of wild because th this is some of the first work I was doing outside of Trident in a sense so I, I mixed this track um, in a completely unknown studio um, and that led to another part of my life because it, it, they wound up wanting to hire me and I actually moved to America to work for Paragon but that's another chapter because uh, <laughs> that led to a lot of trouble but um, yeah uh, anyway, but that that track worked out really well, but it wound up being the B-side uh, for uh, Games Without Frontiers. So, um, uh, a, you know, it's a great, uh, it's a great track, uh, but it was kind of a transition period for um, Peter's production. You know, it was sort of part way between how he'd been with Fripp and part partly on the way to the slightly more um eccentric sound Oof. that he ended up developing with Steve Lilly White after after on the next album. So so that was my introduction to Peter really and um uh it was short lived but I did end up uh being managed by hit and run management. So there's been a sort of real connection with um the whole sort of Genesis brand X Peter Gabriel thing throughout my whole life as a res a result of that sort of Trident period where I was involved with hit and run as well. So yeah, perfect. Oh, now we're talking about Genesis. Uh, in '76, obviously you worked for uh, with the production of uh, the Genesis, uh, a trick of the tail. Uh, you know, at the time, of course. Peter Gabriel have left, They're looking for a singer. They were trying different singer. Uh, Phil Collins, who got a great voice at the time, he he tried to raise his hand, me, 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 pick me. Uh, but then they yeah. were trying different things. And feel free to then again elaborate what you remember. That was well, uh, the trying. They were bringing different people, right? Yeah, it's very hard to remember uh, anything yeah. about that because uh, it's such a long time ago. I, I was a, yeah. an assistant engineer and not yeah. the exclusive engineer for that album. They yep. used to potate us, you know, um, so, uh, and that was quite a long production from memory. So I, I was only involved in a, in a handful of the recording sessions. And I seem to remember being there for, for one of the, uh, uh, one of the sessions where they invited singers in to come and, uh, come and, uh, do a trial vocal on i'm trying to remember which song now um no i can't remember but um but i really i don't remember anybody specific um there was th there were a lot of unknown singers there was yeah. one there was one relatively well-known session singer again whose name I, I can't remember but he he had sung um all the, uh, a lot of the backing vocals on status quo's records and he became very famous as a session backing singer and he was actually quite good but i think there was still this thing where everybody realized that phil collins having already sung solo tracks and backing vocals with peter that he already had the sort of best the best fitting sounding voice to go with what they were doing and and the real understanding so so i can sort of understand why they went that direction in the end rather than um bringing in someone new but uh 
but it was certainly was you know an interesting time that the that that really was my only involvement with genesis but there is one small uh anecdote i have that um uh i i don't remember much about other than the fact that i remember i was asked by um mike rutherford and, and tony if i could help them record a church organ for a film soundtrack they were writing and um so i i remember being um uh being hired to go outside with a portable tape recorder and some microphones to a church somewhere in north london at the crack of dawn uh with tony and mike uh to record uh tony playing an organ solo uh for this film soundtrack now uh this film is called the shout it's not very well known but uh but it's um it is quite a weird eccentric film and um the other weird piece of trivia about that was that those two wrote the music soundtrack but there was also some electronic uh sound recorded and featured in the film because it was actually about a, a weird um avant-garde electronic composer but the uh the electronic side of it and also there's a moment where um the main character does this enormous shout i mean it's a weird film you have to go and look for check it, it up yeah but there is a big shout in the middle of the film uh it's, it's a real psychological thriller um but all this electronics and effects and stuff was composed by rupert hein who i hadn't even met at that stage but so there's this weird connection through this this odd film uh uh through genesis and rupert and of course i i, I think i met rupert shortly after that at trident but uh yeah so um that really was my only uh involvement with genesis around that time yeah wow man can't believe all the people that i was looking <laughs> through the list again of all the people yeah, yeah. Who worked on that. obviously I, i did a bit more work with phil collins uh in yep yeah that's what we're talking now right so all right in 80, 81 to 89 a couple albums with uh actually with phil collins uh you you did the track is in don't let her steal your heart away i think you did the mix and then uh a bhs live at perkins place uh in 82 both in 82 what well that how uh, was like to, the thing to, is i've known i've known phil uh previously yeah. i first met him on a film soundtrack that david henshaw was working on that's the uh, first yeah, time yeah. i met him uh i worked with brand x with phil phil came in and did guest drumming on a rod argent album that was produced by robin lumley so I, i i got to know him quite well through all those connections um but he was uh in the early 80s he was currently having a, a success with the single but he had uh he had recorded this and filmed this live uh show in um i think in san francisco is it uh, perkins palace uh uh they'd recorded the sound for the king biscuit flower hour which uh used to be a, a broadcast thing that happened back in the 80s so they wanted me to mix the um mix the live show which i did and it wound up then being synchronized to the footage they had of that and released on vhs so that was great you know i got to and phil came into the studio to do this while he was in he was in the english top 20 with i guess can't hurry love i think was his hit at that moment yeah but wow in the studio and um and it was great to be um uh mixing you know uh some of his big songs um and uh so so that was fun but when we finished mixing that live he he his next single was uh you just mentioned it uh i did i did a 12 inch mix for uh i've forgotten the title what was it the, yeah the track was don't let her steal your heart away oh that's right yes yes yeah. so the I VHS was live at perkins palace yes yes 
yeah yeah so um that was like two or three intense days in fact it might have been just only like two days in the studio doing all that work uh, and that was the last time i saw phil and uh uh I know he was going through uh, the, a, a lot, a lot of uh, publicity at that time because he was having hits, but he was also having personal problems and things like that. But uh, yeah, correct. I yeah. It being a, a lovely time to uh, hang out with him and catch up, but uh, haven't seen him since 50, uh, forty years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think he's in kind of not in very good shape, according to Mike Rutherford. I saw an interview with Mike that they were asking how the he also. Phil can he's not the, the great and right. You know, it's it's too bad because like I told you before when I when we begin talking, for me Genesis with with Peter Gabriel's call, Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin are according to Claudio the best band in the history of music in yeah. the last fifty years. But that's yeah. my take on the stuff, you know. So yeah. it's going to eventually all of us will die and pass away and it's going yeah. to be a sad He's a very good person, you know. I, I don't, I don't care about his personal problem or divorce or the. No, I, I always remember the, the good things about people and the music. In my, in my case, you know. Exactly. So. I mean, I'm working, I'm, I'm working with a lot of material these days uh, mm. of people who have passed on or, uh, yeah. or the rest. And for me, it's preserving the great work and the and the memory, of course. And keeping, yeah. keeping them alive in that sense is has become very important to me. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, like yeah, like we talked before. You know, it's uh, kind of Mr. Fripp, Robert Fripp. Uh, he's kind of complicated person, many way to to say that. Uh, but he's a great musician. Nobody will deny that, right? So exactly, kind of sometimes go with territory. You know, great yeah. musicians are sometimes difficult to get along with, or so so forth, right? So, but that's that's well. Some, the sometimes of, the yeah. friction between people, you know, yeah. this is something I think we might have talked about before, but. When you get the friction between people like Peter and Robert Fripp or uh, mm. amongst the members of the band UK or even yeah. in the roof of things, there would be times when they would there would be friction between the people. And uh, so many times, that's kind of what creates a lot of the absolute oh, yeah, yeah. moments in the music. Um, so... Yes, a lot of the time music is all about joy and, you know, people coming together and all the rest. But sometimes when there is friction in there, it produces an amazing result. It's it's just that uh, you don't want to really remember too much about that or even talk about that too much because that's not what you want. You want people to sort of get their own feeling yeah. of what music's all about. So, yeah. Uh, and sometimes something very simple, you know, any any band, right? You are sitting in, you know, you're sitting here and sort of uh, the mixing uh, recording uh, booth, and then one, two guys to your left, one to the left, and with the right. No, I want my drums to be better, goddamn. No, I want my guitar in track number two to sound louder than your drum because whatever. And you want two people talking, screaming at you in the back, and you say, man. That's why you have to become a diplomat. That's what it is. Yeah, you need to be like a psychologist to a diplomat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a difficult job, I suppose. But that's that brings creativity, right? If, if, yeah. Or everybody agree on a track and everything, and then only one person is doing the job, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So you, you need input for all the band members. So. Yeah. Uh another great album, eighty four, uh of course Tina Tina Turner, private dancer. Um, break every rule, record and mix in for Capital Records, nineteen eighty four. Yes. What can you remember? Well, that, that? that was a, a very interesting um, project. Uh, Tina had just started to um, have some recognition and uh, success with, uh, I guess, one of the singles she did with uh, Heaven Seventeen, um, and, and the, you know, suddenly. Um, her manager um thought we've got to get an album made and it was an extraordinary thing he he pulled together different teams of people and um had all these different teams working on a couple of songs each during the same two weeks so 
um, because Roger Davis had, uh, you know, he had connections with all kinds of different people. He asked Rupert Hine uh, to um, to uh, produce one song and to write and produce one song for her. And there were various other teams. You know, there was Terry Britton and uh, Mark Knopfler and it, it, you know all these people off in different places. But this meant that um, uh, everybody was kind of preparing the tracks without Tina there. I mean, I think the songs had sort of been either demoed or approved or whatever, but uh, you had these teams working on their couple of songs each at the same time. And so from what I remember, uh, I hadn't met Tina at this point. I think Rupert might have had a production meeting with her and discussed the material. So he'd met her up in London, but we're out in the, um, in Buckinghamshire at the a studio in 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 the countryside and um Rupert would come down and basically prepare the tracks using um keyboards drum machines and uh he also got um the guitarist from the fix Jamie Westorham to come in and play guitar parts and even get involved a bit in the sort of writing and arrangement so we have um, basic, the basic track recorded and, and mixed. And I think it's, it's likely that Rupert might have put a little guide vocal on just so that he had a reference to the melody and everything while he was putting this together. OK, so um, and I hadn't met Tina at this point. So th then it was it was planned for her to come down and do her vocal. Now, this started to feel like um, probably quite a lot of pressure because, you know, it's Tina for, for starters, you know, the massive star I haven't met yet. And we know she's a great performer. And, you know, I better be ready, you know. And from what I learned, Rupert gave uh, Tina a lift from London out to Farmyard Studios. It's about 45 minute drive. And from what I understand, he had a cassette of the uh, track in the car. And so she was rehearsing it, sitting in the passenger seat of his car all the way. Apparently, they had, real looks. They had real looks when they stopped at traffic lights, you know, and people could see, I see a diner in there singing. <laughs> um, wow. But anyway, so she turned up at the studio. We were introduced. And it was almost like she was raring to go. And I'd spent the couple of hours leading up to this making sure i had a really good headphone mix you know very something that's very sort of hopefully creative and inspiring so that she would react to it but also i, I had to sort of guess what microphone am i going to use but i i when i work with some singers you lay out a, a collection of microphones four or five microphones to see which one works best with their voice tina you did you better be ready to record right from the first moment. So I chose a microphone, a Neumann microphone. And then I thought, right, OK, I've got to be ready that I can get the levels and the sound and everything right really quickly because um, it's going to be a lot of pressure. So I had, you know, a, a chain of uh, proce audio processing in line ready that I could adjust quickly and make choices. So I was terrified. I was terrified because I, I knew, it, you know, it literally was. It, we don't have a run through to get sound checks or anything like that. It's like you better press record like from the first moment. So I. And I'd met Tina and she was lovely and all the rest. But I, you know, I was I was, as I say, a bit nervous anyway. So Rupert came in. She went out in the studio and they, he said, OK, you're going to hear the track. Um, we'll give it a run through, he said to her. So, OK, so I pressed play and record and I was there standing over the, the knobs, you know, ready to control things. And she started singing and I, what I had expected was that she would probably go from a whisper to a shout in you know a moment so 
how am I going to be ready for the kind of level and all of that? Anyway.